Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, installment of the China, Chinese Business History uh, webinar. My name is John Wong. I'm, I work at the University of Hong Kong. And today we are honored to have uh, joining us Jason um, Kelly, an assistant professor at the U.S. Naval War College and an associate um, in research at the Fairbanks Center at Harvard. He received his PhD from Cornell and was previously a foreign service officer at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. And the topic of his talk today is Market um, Maoist, the Communist Origins of China's Capitalist, capitalist Ascent. Um, we are following the webinar format today. Uh, the talk is being recorded. Uh, please feel free at any moment to type in your questions in the uh, Q&A box, and we will handle them at the conclusion of the talk. Uh, Jason, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much, John. Um, and thanks virtually to Kassan who can't make it today, but I'm, I'm grateful to both of you for inviting me to be here. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming today. I know how busy it is. Uh, there's so much going on. It's a, it's a busy time of year. So I, I certainly do appreciate your taking the time today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. Bear with me here. Okay. Um, so, as, as John said, the title of my talk is Market Maoists, the Communist Origins of China's Capitalist Ascent. Uh, that also, not coincidentally, happens to be the title of my book, my first book, which came out uh, just about a year ago, last May, uh, with Harvard University Press. Um, and the book tells the story of the commercial relationships that linked the Chinese Communist Party to capitalists and capitalist markets all around the world. Uh, beginning in the late 1930s, so it starts. The story starts really in the in the summer of 1937 with the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War, and then I trace those relationships through the Chinese Civil War and into the uh, the late 1940s and into the founding, past the founding of the new Chinese Communist State in October 1949, and then continue on for the first two decades plus um, of the People's Republic of China. So all the way up until uh, 1973, which is roughly where the, the meat of the book concludes. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why 1973 in, in just a second. But as folks here know, that's a four or five years before, a full five years before um, the time, the opening and reform era, when we typically think about, start to pay attention to China's relationships to uh, global capitalism and capitalist markets around the world. So this is a story that unfolds much, much before that. Um, and there's obviously there's a lot in there, so I'm not going to have time to get to the entire book in the next 25, 30 minutes. But what I want to do instead is uh, break the talk into three chunks, really. And the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the project started, because I'm somebody I'm always interested in how people land on their dissertation projects, which is how this started, and then uh, what drives them through the book writing process. And so I'll talk a little bit about the origins of the project at first. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to touch on just some of the puzzles and paradoxes and themes in the book that I think will give you, I hope, will give you a sense of, of what the book is about, um, some of the ground that it covers. Um, I'll give you a quick fly through some of the chapters as well. And then I think this might be helpful for Q&A and discussion afterwards, some of the material there. And then finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with um, just a couple of comments on, on why I think the book matters, not just for historians of, of Chinese business, but really uh, for people who are interested in China and the world today and Chinese commerce and diplomacy um, in, in our current era. Okay, so origins of the book. So this, this project started, um, geez, 10 years ago already in between 2010 and 2012, when I was, as John mentioned, I was in the foreign service before I came back and did my PhD at Cornell. Uh, and in, in that time, when I was posted to the US embassy in Beijing, I became increasingly fascinated by the, um, this was not a unique phenomenon, everybody was fascinated by the pace and the scope of change in China at this time. And so I, I began to think about this as a historical problem, and when I left the Foreign Service and went to do my graduate work, I fully expected to focus on uh, reform and opening. That seemed like the logical choice. I should say, too, that I, I first lived in China in 2002. I taught English there for a year. So that was my, my reference point. And people who have been living in China and working in China uh, for much longer than that point out that there were fantastic changes in the years well before I ever arrived, too. So um, I, I think 
the 10 years that I experienced from 2002 to 2010 were just the fragments of the change that fascinated me. So anyway, I went back to Cornell and I started to work on kind of the foundational research for something dealing with reform and opening. But as I as I waded into that project, uh, I got more and more interested in the Mao era antecedents to reform and opening and little snippets and insights into that early trade um, caught my attention more than I than I first expected. So for example, in December of 1949, Mao writes this cable to the Central Committee in which he, he urges his colleagues, um, uh, his lieutenants essentially, uh, that it's important to keep in mind the, the the future of the new Chinese communist states trade relationships with the United Kingdom and the United States and Japan and India, right? Countries that I did not think would be at the forefront of Mao's mind on the eve of his trip to Moscow in 19, winter of 1949, 1950, uh, but it was there, right? So that I found interesting. And as I dug into some of the relevant material, um, it became pretty clear that there was consistent, persistent trade between China and capitalist states all around the world during the Mao era. Um, and there's really fantastic work done by Cold War era um, economists like Alexander Eckstein and political scientists then and subsequently on the nature of that trade. Um, but what really interested me was not so much the statistics and the figures um, and what those meant, for China in terms of the trade between the Chinese Communist Party and the PRC uh, on the one hand and capitalist markets on the other. But I was really interested in the stories and how that actually worked. So how did it really, how did Mao era trade work uh, outside of the socialist bloc? What did it look like? What did it feel like? What kind of effect did it have on grassroots traders? How did it affect the thinking of the senior uh, party and state officials who were responsible for orchestrating this? this trade throughout these various political campaigns during the Mao era. And then ultimately the, the bigger question that really interested me was how does this affect the identity of the Chinese Communist Party as a whole? This facet of uh, China's international experience under Mao that, that was not something that I was very familiar with and didn't seem to be addressed anywhere in the, in the literature. And so that's that, those are the kinds of questions that brought me into the project. And as I worked on finalizing the dissertation and turning it into a book, um, I, I sort of hung all of those questions on this 4-3 this program, uh, as it's called. Oh, I forgot to mention, this is Deng Xiaoping in uh, Tokyo in 1978. I put that in there to kind of give you a sense of how the project started. I always forget to mention the, the photographs and the images, so I'm gonna do my best to be diligent on that front. Um, so all of those questions, though, circulating in my mind, I, I hung them on this idea of, the, of, of this, this phenomenon of the 4-3 program in 1973. And so for those who don't know, this was a massive uh, import scheme proposed by the State Planning Commission. In uh, It started out in early 1972 and then sort of snowballed into a much larger package. It's called the 4.3 program because it's the grand total uh, of anticipated imports reached 4.3 billion US dollars. Um, all of this import scheme was dedicated to trade with capitalists. All of this was envisioning massive infusions of capitalist um, technology and capital stock into the People's Republic of China to help boost production in China. And all of it was supposed to come from capitalist states and it was all supposed to happen within the next three to five years. So it's this massive ambitious program uh, and it's being proposed in 1973, right? So we're still past the, the least stable period of the Cultural Revolution, but certainly not out of the, the woods yet uh, in that phase of Chinese history. How does, how does this program, this massive capitalist-oriented import program, fit with that Cultural Revolution context? And how does it fit more broadly with Mao's vision of building this socialist revolutionary uh, and modern Chinese state. Um, so the book starts with this 4-3 program and then tells this sort of backstory building up to the moment to explain how, how it was that this program was not just proposed, but it also, I should say, sailed through the approval process. So Li Xianyan uh, was a booster for it. Um, Zhou Enlai signed off on it and Mao did as well. So there was no, there was no significant um, opposition to the program when it was proposed in 1973. All right, and so in thinking about the this question and answers that that 
or stories that might help to put this program into, into context. I, I think over the course of the writing process, I uncovered this paradoxical momentum, right? Where just as the Chinese revolution is coming into bloom uh, and this new state is coming into being, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is wading deeper and deeper into capitalist markets abroad. And this wasn't necessarily seen as a fundamental or fatal contradiction. These two developments could be pursued in tandem for the betterment of the revolution and for the betterment of China too. Um, and it's important to, I think, to note that this this paradoxical momentum was not, it wasn't an oversight. It's not as though this trade was occurring uh, only on the margins. We're not, I'm not talking about uh, black market trade or trade that was occurring outside of the state purview. This was a concerted, considered and persistent effort on behalf of the state to pursue expanded trade ties with capitalists around the world during these key Maoist years. And the evidence for that uh, in the book comes from a whole host of sources. You can see this persistence and this effort to expand these trade ties uh, in the deals themselves, right? So I did a lot of archival work uh, in the US, in the UK, in Japan, uh, in China, in Hong Kong. So you can see it in the deals. Um, you can see them in the policies as well, right? And I know other scholars have looked at the, the evolution of the policy making process for foreign trade during this era and drawn some insights there. So that's a valuable um, perspective and a valuable source of materials to, to draw insights from. I also use a lot of internal, newly available uh, Chinese Communist Party and state documents that I collected over the years um, to shed light on what those internal deliberations looked like uh, among senior party officials and in some cases, lower level officials about how this trade agenda should be pursued um, what to do when presented with sometimes awkward contradictions or, or unclear circumstances? How do you, how do you formulate a, a consistent policy um, when you're trying to pursue expanded trade on the one hand, and on the other hand, you're dealing with a new campaign that's coursing through society back home, right? Um, and then other, other kinds of resources like advertising, right? This is an image on the left here from the late 1950s during the Great Leap Forward. Uh, it's an advertisement geared for capitalist consumers abroad, produced by uh, Chinese PRC um, ad copywriters, right? So this is another example and another kind of facet of this effort to expand trade that I explore in the book. Uh, but the upshot of all of these sources and, and, and this paradoxical momentum is that there's this sustained uh, and justified over the years, justified commercial presence in capitalist markets uh, during the Mao era, throughout the entire Mao era. Um, now, what were the effects of this sustained presence in these markets over time? That's, that's kind of the, the narrative arc of the book that I follow. And so what you see here is this is the kind of the core of the book. There's seven main chapters, um, and it starts, like I said, in the summer of 1937 with the first Sino-Japanese, or the second Sino-Japanese war, sorry, uh, in July of 1937. And the first chapter is called, what I'll do now is I'll just kind of walk you through briefly the, the seven chapters, not in too much detail, but just to give you a sense of the arc of 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 the narrative, but also the ground that's covered. Um, in that first chapter, it's re which really starts um, during the war because that's the first instance when the Chinese Communist Party makes this concerted effort to develop a presence in overseas capitalist markets in Hong Kong, the British colony of Hong Kong at the time, um, by developing front companies uh, and using these front companies to trade also to secure imports. And over time, by the mid-1940s, these front companies, uh, the party has tied them to uh, agricultural production in North and Northeast China through shipping. Um, so essentially, the, a lot of the, the agricultural products, soybeans and, and um, wheat, was shipped by train from Northeast China to North Korean ports and then shipped from North Korean ports with Soviet shipping, Soviet flag vessels down to Hong Kong, where it was sold on the open market. Uh, and the proceeds were then deposited in the uh, local banks, including HSBC, which is what you see on the left here in Hong Kong, uh, in safe deposit boxes. And the proceeds were used to buy things like wireless radios um, and food and blankets and things that were needed in the communist areas. And then we ship back up uh, using the same socialist um, shipping lanes and chartered leased ships. Uh, so that's where the story begins. And from there, I follow the story up into chapter two, which is closing the open door, which is about how by the late 
1948-1949 period as the Chinese Communist Party is moving its way south, uh, consolidating control over urban centers, it's presented for the first time with this challenge of how do you, first, how do you run these large cities? They didn't have that experience, but also uh, what's what should foreign trade policy look like and how should local officials and, and cadres interact with these longstanding commercial interests in places like Tianjin uh, and Shanghai by late spring uh, 1949. And so the story in chapter two is how the party managed to exert control over those commercial relationships and tried to do so without snuffing out those commercial ties altogether, that balancing act. Um, the third chapter then shifts to the post 1949 period. So that's really when the state comes into the narrative. Uh, and it starts out explaining how these new state institutions developed um, and how they were staffed and incentivized to pursue all kinds of trade, of course, but a, a significant portion of that was trade designed to um, target, not target, designed to develop relationships with, with businesses and firms and individuals beyond the socialist bloc. And a key theme in this chapter too, though, um, is, is the Korean War because it was so important in shaping the way that these new trade institutions thought about their mandates. Um, as, as I'm sure many of you know, one of the consequences of China's involvement in the Korean War is that by December of 1950, uh, the United States Commerce Department enacted an embargo against China, which is designed to sort of push China out of global markets. Um, that had a profound effect on the way Chinese communist officials thought about trade with capitalists and in a maybe unanticipated way, at least as far as the Commerce Department in the U.S. was concerned, uh, it mobilized these trade officials because the embargo was something to rally the trade troops against. And it became anti-imperialist to trade with imperialists because you're undermining the, the U.S.-led embargo. So that's the story uh, in that third chapter. And from there, uh, I switch to the post-war years, the mid-1950s, mid to late 1950s, the commerce and the making of peaceful coexistence. And that shows how during the uh, mid-1950s, as China was trying to present this image of itself as a peaceful, um, open, cooperative power following the Korean War, um, trade served as an important testament to China's peaceful ambitions. And the key venue for this in the chapter is the Geneva Conference where you know, most of the conversation was centered on politics and military affairs, but China also sent a very able trade diplomat, uh, Lei Renmin, who was charged with brokering deals, with meeting with British and other European officials and trying to cement agreements for um, imports and exports, but also for tours, uh, mutual tours, exhibitions, to foster commercial, commercial contact between the two countries. Um, all of that changes significantly in the next chapter, however, during the Great Leap Forward, a great leap in trade, which explains how the revolutionary fervor of the Great Leap Forward and the press for expansion and metrics of expansion coursed through the Ministry of Foreign Trade as well and shaped the way that many trade officials conducted their work. Um, that push for expansion absolutely applied to capitalist trade with, with non-socialists as well. Um, the goal was to expand trade across the board, both imports and exports. Um, and that impulse combined with the decentralization push of the Great Leap Forward really, in a lot of ways, wreaked havoc on China's foreign trade diplomacy, uh, which caused all number of problems uh, in terms of, its, uh, of China's trade relations with capitalist firms outside of the socialist bloc. And we can come back to that in Q&A if, if folks are interested. I'd be happy to explore that a little bit more. Um, the final two chapters, Trading for Salvation, is, is essentially picking up the pieces in the aftermath of the Great Leap Forward, um, how China turned to grain markets in Australia and Canada to feed starving people after the Great Leap, um, but also turned to Western Europe for capital imports uh, because the embargo had begun to fray by the late 1950s. There were new opportunities for massive imports of factories and turnkey plants um, from Western Europe. And that chapter kind of covers that, that initiative as well and what the party learned and what state trade officials learned as well. And the last chapter 
uh, deals with the cultural revolution, essentially. And the massive shifts, it discusses some of the consequences for the early trade pioneers who show up in chapters one and two, um, but it also explains how changes in international politics in the 1970s, early 1970s, and in politics at home in China uh, breathes new life into some of these longstanding trade initiatives and allow these initiatives to expand um, in ways that they weren't able to in the 50s and 60s. And that helps to explain how we see the seven, I'm sorry, the 4-3 program in 1973. So that is a that is a very quick and dirty run through. Um, there's a lot, a lot I tried to fit in there. So what I want to do now is take a step back and just kind of touch on a few bigger themes that might lend themselves uh, to some conversation in the next few minutes. Um, the one thing that I want to stress here is that I don't, I'm not suggesting, I'm not arguing that this momentum, this paradoxical momentum was a steady momentum, not, not by any stretch. Um, there was, I think, with the benefit of hindsight, we can stand back and look and see how there was a gradual push to expand, to expand, to expand, but it was fitful. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, given the twists and turns of domestic politics and the various campaigns uh, occurring in Mao's China at this time, uh, it was extremely contingent and unpredictable. And that meant that for some of the trade officials, um, it was a very high stakes, challenging agenda to pursue this kind of trade. This is Chen Yun in 1958, uh, before the bottom fell out of the Great Leap Forward, but he was instrumental in trying to put things right um, in terms of trade policy in the early 1960s and beyond uh, because of some of those setbacks during the Great Leap Forward. Um, and the, the sort of corollary to that is that reform and opening was by no means an inevitable consequence of these early precedents. I don't, I'm not suggesting that in the book. And I say that explicitly. Um, there was a lot of contingency at work here and things could have turned out quite differently um, had certain decisions or certain events unfolded in different ways. Um, so even though it might seem that the book in, in emphasizing this paradoxical momentum um, is building toward reform and opening. Uh, I don't think that was a, a foregone conclusion by any stretch. But I do think the momentum is still important um, when we step back and look at it. And I think it's important because it tells us something about Chinese Communist Party identity formation. Um, and that's interesting to me on a number of levels. And I try to flesh this out in the book in a couple of different ways. One of the key things that I found is that these international commercial interactions with firms and individuals outside the socialist bloc really required a lot of ideological and intellectual work on the behalf or on the part of these trade officials, right? Because they're responsible for relating the, the shifting political orthodoxies at home to the various market exigencies abroad, right? And that's a really difficult thing to do when so much is in flux uh, inside China, and so many changes in markets um, abroad don't necessarily take those domestic changes into account, if that makes sense. So each new campaign that worked its way through the Chinese political landscape, um, each new movement, all of this had to be reconciled with not just what's going on in markets around the world, but also with existing trade policies that the party and the Ministry of Foreign Trade and various trade officials had established. There's this constant period of adjustment. Each new campaign brings these new political lines that have to be then uh, reconciled with existing policy. And then these policies simultaneously have to be reconciled with what's going on in various markets all over the world. So it was this really complicated uh, iterative process that I think by tracing it, I came away with a much better appreciation uh, and a much more nuanced understanding and a complicated understanding of CCP identity formation than maybe a tighter focus on elite decision-making and diplomacy uh, at, the, at the elite level would, would give us. Um, and that's because a lot of the book does take place at, at the working level. So um, one of the things that is important to note, I think, about the book. And one of the things that I took away from the book is that Mao certainly set the direction of Chinese foreign policy in many instances, especially questions of war and peace. Uh, and he helped to set the context uh, for a lot of the diplomatic decision making. But the diplomacy and the commercial diplomacy that unfolded during this period uh, wasn't always 
necessarily in lockstep with those grand pronouncements at the elite Mao senior level. And partly that's because, you know, Mao, I don't think this is a surprise. When Mao was not particularly interested in economics, he knew very, very little. We'll say his, his understanding of, of uh, international commercial norms and practices was slim, to say the least. Uh, and so that left space for lower level officials to link the sort of broad sweep pronouncements and political ideas that Mao would propose or espouse to uh, the various norms and aesthetics and social conventions of international commerce that Mao would not have had exposure to, but working level Chinese officials did. Uh, people like this on the right, this is Qin Bangxian, who um, was the founder of China Resources, now a multi-billion dollar company, but in 1937, 38, when it was first started, was a small mom and pop uh, import export company that looked like any other import exporter in Hong Kong uh, in the 30s. And his job early on, he's a perfect example, he, he shows up early in the book, was to try to figure out what his role was, what affectations he should take on, what principles he should emphasize, how to negotiate, all of these tricky questions that he had to figure out as a representative of this Chinese Communist Party. Um, and then later on, uh, after 1949 as his quasi representative of the Chinese state as well. And there was ample room for him to explore what those connections would look, would look like, how to represent the state, how to represent the party as a business person in a capitalist environment. Um, but they were high stakes decisions with pretty severe consequences too. Uh, and for him personally, um, later on during the cultural revolution, but also for many others as well. Um, at the same time, you know, it wasn't just individuals who were trying to figure out how to connect policy at the elite level to practices in capitalist environments abroad. Institutions are a really important part of this story, too. Uh, and that's because these institutions, party institutions at first and then state institutions after 1949, like any bureaucracy, different elements of the institutions develop their own metrics and their own incentive structures um, to pursue whatever their bureaucratic mandates are. And there are elements in the Ministry of Foreign Trade uh, by the early 1950s that are charged with seeing the expansion of trade in markets that are not socialist and capitalist markets. And so these institutions have to develop their own rationales, their own justifications for pursuing those bureaucratic mandates. And so that, that's another place where it's not elite decision makers making pronouncements and setting policy and having policy being carried out exactly as it was conceived in Beijing, but institutions filtering these policies um, and connecting them to their own institutional mandates. And that process further shapes um, the way the policy is implemented. Uh, and it's part of this iterative process that I mentioned earlier. The two key players institutionally uh, in the book are the Ministry of Foreign Trade and the CCPIT, the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, which was a kind of a quasi-governmental institution that was charged with um, overseeing and developing trade relationships with other chapters around the world uh, following the Moscow conference in the 1950s. So the, one of the big questions in the background too is th that I've heard before um, and that is worth spending a second on is, well, what was the underlying rationale? So institutions could justify trade um, because they had to as bureaucracies and individuals who worked in trade had to justify trade uh, because it was part of their responsibilities and, and their livelihood. Um, but why was the state so interested in maintaining these trade relations with outside the socialist bloc, so with capitalists around the world? Uh, and I think it probably won't surprise many to see that there are essentially three large drivers that were fairly consistent over the period covered in the book. And the first is just plain old financial consideration. So it's cheaper sometimes to ship some goods to some places regardless of their political disposition, right? So for example, in the late 1940s, um, it's just cost effective to ship Chinese iron to Japan, despite the fact that the Second Sino-Japanese just war ended and um, there's, there's a lot of ill will there politically. Uh, it made sense financially to pursue those trade relationships. Um, a second driving factor was technology, was the, the state's search for uh, the kinds of technologies that could fuel China's modernization at home. Now, obviously, a lot of that technology that, that China um, 
found so critical to early development and modernization came from the Soviet Union in the 1950s, but not all of it, right? And especially after the Sino-Soviet split became apparent and public in the 19, in 1960 uh, or thereabouts, uh, the, the trade institutions in China, the Ministry of Foreign Trade, made a concerted effort to reach out to Western Europe in pursuit of the kinds of technologies that would allow China to boost its industrial production, but also its, its uh, agricultural production too, in terms of um, uh, chemical fertilizer production, for example. And the third, and this is the one that I find the most interesting, the third sort of driver of the capitalist trade agenda for the party and for the state was political aims, political decision-making. Um, trade served politics in so many different ways in this story. Um, it was very common for trade officials to use the promise of trade uh, to bolster diplomacy, to reinforce messages, right? So later in, in, in the Geneva conference, showcasing Chinese goods um, and promising stable deals and mutually beneficial agreements bolstered this image of China as a peaceful, inclusive uh, trading partner for the world. Um, but it also showcased China's success, right? So obviously many of these trade exhibitions would feature the kinds of goods that would showcase Chinese modernity too later on. So China before liberation was exporting primarily hog bristles and tongue oil and, and basic agricultural goods. And the party by the 1950s and 1960s was trying to uh, emphasize its, its or showcase its, its economic development by, show, by um, exhibiting light industrial goods, for example. So transistor radios, bicycles, things like that to show that China was moving its way up the value chain. Uh, and capitalist audiences were an important part of that message. Uh, and the final part is, is simply just strengthening China, right? Using trade to um, expedite China's modernization drive uh, in any way possible. And that was a, a clear political aim that helped to fuel that interest in, in trade with capitalists as well as socialists earlier on. Now, despite the various shifting reasons that for trade that come up uh, throughout the book, there are two big themes that are consistent throughout uh, that the party, uh, I don't want to say clings to, but is steadfast on. First is that trade always served politics, always. And I think that's a, that's a trend that, that remains, that's a conviction that remains relevant today. Uh, and second, this related idea that unchecked markets threaten the CCP and the state and the revolution itself. So uncontrolled massing of capital and power, for example, could challenge the party's claim to ultimate authority. And so these two, these two convictions remained consistent throughout the story. And the challenge then for the party was to figure out a way to find a balance. Like how is it that you can tap into these productive capacities, the technology and the resources and the opportunities without relinquishing control? And I think that's still uh, a, a driving force or a challenge that the, the PRC is facing today. And I'll conclude now um, with just a couple of thoughts on, on how this story is still relevant today. And the first is just that, that I think the PRC is still searching for that balance between control and openness uh, in terms of commercial diplomacy. It's also important to note that these early Mao era experiences shaped the way that the party sought out this balance and thinks about what this balance um, might look like, right? Um, and beyond that, the precedents served a really vital role, especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, of legitimizing the reform and opening agenda, because there were very clear Mao-era precedents that Deng Xiaoping could and did point to explicitly to say, look, China's been pursuing these kinds of open commercial relationships with, with countries all around the world, capitalist and socialist. Uh, it's just that the circumstances weren't right at the time. That's partly true, but there's enough truth in there to make that a, a compelling or saleable argument. Um, and you can see that in the slide here. This is a, this is a screen grab of a, a People's Daily article online from a couple months ago. And that last phrase there, Ping Dong Hu Li, uh, stretches all the way back to the pre-1949 era as a fundamental principle, legitimizing uh, framework that helped to shape how the party uh, conducted trade. And so you can trace that lineage from today all the way back to the, the pre-1949 era. The last thing I'll say, ooh, I think I'm kind of, kind of close to the time here, John, I'll wrap it up, um, is that these, these Mao era legacies also helped post-Mao leaders think more expansively about what China's options were in the 1970s when continued 
mobilization and communism and doubt, uh, continued revolutionary mobilization, that path to socialist modernity came under increasing suspicion for a number of reasons by the end of the, of the Cultural Revolution. I think these past experiences gave Li Xianian and Chen Yun and others uh, a well to draw from when they thought about China's next steps and what the, the, the breakdown of the socialist bloc meant for China and what China's options were. Um, the very last thing I'll say here is one of the things I try to do in the book also, I spent a lot of time on this, is to make these connections accessible, not just to specialists like us uh, who are interested in Chinese business history and interested in history in China, but even but general readers too, uh, because I think these precedents do matter today. And I think they are helpful for understanding where China is in the world and what Chinese commerce and diplomacy looks like today. And so because of that, I spent a lot of time in the book emphasizing individuals, people uh, who did this work and what their lived experiences were like. Um, and the upshot, I think, is a very different image of the Chinese Communist Party than perhaps many of us uh, are used to. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Let's stop. There we go. Thank you, Jason. Fascinating. Um, can't wait to learn more about this. We have, uh, well, please, uh, audience, uh, please continue to enter your questions. We have a few questions and comments already in uh, the boxes. Um, I think it actually uh, is testimony to how, how your talk actually touches on uh, the work of many people. Um, let me try to group some of the questions together. I guess we have a couple um, that uh, speak to uh, the possibility of dissonance um, or incongruence. Uh, one would like to ask you about the effect or, or the knowledge uh, in domestic China, in, inside the PRC, how much uh, people knew about this trade um, with the capitalist um, and how this, the party state managed its propaganda around trading with capitalists domestically versus internationally. It comes from our colleague, uh, Li Feng Chou. Yeah, thank you. Those are fantastic questions, actually. Uh, they, they... So the knowledge, there, there was public knowledge and, and different, it depends on when we're talking about, right? But there are these key moments in this period when um, state propaganda outlets really emphasize the importance of trade with capitalists for political reasons. So for example, in the chapter on the Korean War, there's this, um, this famous now long forgotten conference in Moscow, the Moscow International Economic Conference in April of 1952. And this was a huge public diplomacy campaign. Um, it was hosted by the Soviet Union. China played a very, very active role there. And the entire affair was to showcase, the whole point was to showcase uh, how China and the Soviet Union represented an open, inclusive approach to international trade that differed, that stood in stark contrast to what the United States was doing by enacting these embargoes and leaning on its allies to prevent them from trading with China and with other socialist countries. And so the, the Chinese Communist Party and the state were really pushing this uh, juxtaposition to mobilize not only people around the world because those messages were circulated abroad as well by Chinese diplomats and in, in Chinese news services, um, but also domestically. So after that conference, state newspapers touted it as a major success against uh, and tearing down the embargo, right? Shaking the foundation of the embargo. So they would point to uh, the number of deals concluded, the dollar figures attached to the deals as kind of markers of how much they had taken, taken the embargo down um, and as a kind of a mobilizing technique. And so that's, I think the most vivid example of that, but there are others as well in the book that show uh, how the state did lean on the, the propaganda apparatus as a way to, to pursue different political objectives by, by pointing at this trade with capitalists. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. We have another question that um, broadens, I guess, the horizon, uh, not just within China, but into uh, the rest of the Soviet bloc, uh, the communist bloc. Uh, Hong Yuan Wang would like to know on what basis did China trade with the Soviet bloc, especially strategic goods like armaments and computer technology? So it sounds like you are, you are talking about different stages, especially your mention of the Sino-Soviet split, but uh, enlighten us a little bit more on that, please. Yeah, so uh, on what basis, uh, a very steady basis at first is the short answer to that, I suppose. So during 
uh, by the during the civil Chinese Civil War, um, there, but especially toward the later years, there was significant trade. Uh, I think the Soviet Union was a, a lifeline of sorts in providing goods because um, because the party was so desperate um, as the war progressed, as the army size increased, as the amount of territory that China can, uh, the Communist Party controlled increased, uh, the Soviets provided a trade lifeline. Uh, in the early 1950s, that was the heyday of this trade. And if you look, there's a graph in the book that shows the balance between um, communist China's trade with communists and with capitalists, as defined by um, the Chinese Communist Party in this internal document that, which, from which it came in 1956. And you can see in that that in starting in 1951, there's a huge shift away from trade with capitalists toward trade with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. I mean, it's a fantastically large shift. Um, so there is an important pivot there uh, that's noteworthy. But what's important to remember too, though, is that that reflects mostly a massive increase in the amount of China's trade with the Soviet Union and other socialist countries, not necessarily or not a decrease in the amount of trade with capitalist countries. So in other words, the trade with socialists increases such that uh, it begins to swamp capitalist trades in relative terms, but capitalist trade remains just about the same, several hundred million dollars a year, according to internal Chinese documents. So the, that 1950s shift is huge, um, but it shifts again, right? It shifts again by 1960, um, when the Sino-Soviet split occurs, becomes um, quite severe, and Chinese, uh, Moscow decides to withdraw its, Soviet, its technical and economic advisors. And you see the exact same switch in reverse, where China's trade pivots back toward, on balance, uh, so-called capitalist countries. And that's the final pivot, at least up to the present. It never returns back to the Soviet side of the scale. Well, that's a great um, lead on to the following question. Uh, you know, your, your mention of the quantitative shifts and also the direction, directional change. Uh, we have a couple of questions on the scale of the trade. Um, yeah. That's from uh, Jet, our, our colleague, and also Winnie Eli. Uh, they would like to know how big these trades are you know, as a percentage of GDP, um, you know, how, how it was framed in political bureaucratic history, um, and also in assessing the impact relevance of this trade, some statistical framework that would be uh, highly uh, helpful. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, a sliver is the answer. I mean, relative to China's GDP, it's never more than 10%. So it's a, it's a, it's a tiny, narrow sliver um, of trade, of, of economic activity that we're talking about. Now, partly that's because uh, China's a massive economy anyway, and so it tends to have a relatively small amount of its economic activity taken up by foreign trade. But, but it is not an impressive figure. And that's one of the things that in the book, I, I address this point specifically because it's so important, because it, the numbers are not impressive, um, which I think has led a lot of us to discount it for a long time because of that, right? And that is exactly how I approached it when I first started to look at these numbers, because they're so underwhelming. Um, but what I realized is that when I started out, I was confusing these quantitative metrics for historical significance. And they weren't, I, I came to the belief now, and I'm, I'm still convinced that they're not necessarily the same thing. So volume isn't necessarily a good proxy for historical significance. Um, and that's something that I, I have had to wrestle with in the book. And I've come out convincing myself, at least, of no one else that that's the case. Um, because even though this was just a sliver of the amount of trade, uh, the effect that that process of coordinating and orchestrating the trade had was, was profound in historical terms because it went on to shape the changes that came after Mao and on um, any quantitative scale, you know, we're talking about post-1978, that obviously becomes very significant in a way that it wasn't before that. Um, Jed also has uh, another question. Um, it is, do you, uh, do you have an idea of the legal instruments through which this trade was structured? Um, he says, there is a traditional understanding that few, if any, basic contract law conventions were familiar to domestic mainland economic actors pre-1978, and this lack thus necessitated an aggressive investment um, in learning these forms post-1978. Uh, why wouldn't this trade you detail have created a greater set of precedents or knowledge in the legal arena? That's a good question. I don't know that it was non-existent. I mean, I know that um, that there were many 
so the mid night early mid 1960s 1962 to 1965 is an interesting period in the story because it's after the COCOM restrictions, the embargo restrictions on China um, began to sort of fray and the opportunity for greater and more complicated trade arrangements with European, Western European states and firms became more feasible. Um, there's an interesting his evidentiary trail of how um, party officials and state officials in Western Europe are, are trying to figure out how to do this because it's it's clear that they're out of their depth and not just in terms of the of the legal issues but also just contract law for sure but also the technical specifications of some of these projects and and the logistical trail and all of the everything that comes along with these massive more complicated trade structures that they were not well equipped to handle uh, by 1963 so I think 1962 to 1965 I think partly, the reason there wasn't as much sophistication on that front is because the nature of the deals were, were relatively straightforward and simple before that. Uh, a lot of agricultural exports in exchange for um, relatively simple imports. That becomes more complicated by, by the 1960s. And what you see then is party trade officials saying, look, we, we essentially have to get our act together. We need to be, uh, we need to have more contact. And there are um, pretty specific instructions to trade officials at various missions telling them, look, you know, you don't have, this is how to conduct a negotiation. This is how to shop around. These are the kinds of considerations to take into effect. These are the kinds of contract issues you should be mindful of. Um, that shows maybe kind of what you were getting at that, that perhaps it wasn't as sophisticated as it, as it might otherwise have been uh, before that. And the sad thing is that the story then cuts out in 1965 well, with the start of the Cultural Revolution, um, and that significantly complicates a lot of these processes. And so by the 1970s, with this 4-3 program is when we start to see another push, a sort of rekindling of this interest in the Ministry of Foreign Trade to figure out how these trade deals work, to really get the fundamentals that you're talking about in terms of contract law and dispute settlement and um, and technical specifications and installment procedures and all of that uh, kind of rekindles by the 70s, um, which brings us up to the period that I think you're talking about. Well, that's great. Um, I'm not sure about the quantitative aspects in terms of its proportion of uh, GDP in China, but uh, the effect of this trade on Hong Kong was certainly immense. Um, I love the picture that you showed of the HSBC, HSBC, HSBC building, uh, which obviously sits next to the old Bank of China building. And that's uh, growing up in Hong Kong was quite a sight to me. I, I didn't quite understand that. I'm still trying to understand that whole situation. Uh, we have a couple of questions on that. Uh, uh, Yun Wang asks, uh, if you could elaborate more on the agents in Hong Kong that facilitated uh, commercial relations between the PRC and, common, and capitalist countries, especially in uh, Western Europe. Um, and we have a similar question from our colleague in uh, Singapore, uh, Chen Ji Wei, who, asks, uh, who talked about, who asked you to, to elaborate a little bit more on the role of state-owned or state-controlled traders located in Hong Kong, such as uh, China Resources or China, and uh, Warren. Uh, which could be uh, important in this calculation um, in Mao's China? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the agents are just endlessly fascinating. Um, they, they really are. So, I, you know, I had the slide of, of, of Qin Bangxian, who was, um, like so many other of these, these agents or these, these business people, were uh, fairly cosmopolitan, sophisticated. Many of them were born abroad. Most spoke multiple languages. Um, and they were comfortable in more cosmopolitan environments for all the obvious reasons, right? And so in the 1930s uh, and into the 1940s, many of these official, or not officials, these, these agents as we'll call them, um, they, because the trade infrastructure was so small, they knew top officials. So Qin Bangxian knew uh, Chen Yun um, and his brother, by the way, was, I'm sorry, Qin Bangli, I'm saying Qin Bangxian, his name was Qin Bangli. Qin Bangxian was Bo Gu, that was his brother. So clearly he's, he was tied in, he's a known quantity. Um, but that was the case with many of the key kind of pioneers in Hong Kong who were working on behalf of the party. Many spoke English, Japanese, um, some spoke Russian. So they were very, a very sophisticated polyglot group. At the same time, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them were alumni of the 8th Route Army Office Network. So when, during the Second United Front, when the KMT allowed um, the Chinese Communist Party to open administrative offices, essentially, at various cities, KMT-controlled cities along the eastern seaboard and then farther inland later, 
um, the, the party members who staffed those offices learned about logistics and trade and learned how to operate in those environments. And many of those people who served in those army offices during the war subsequently moved down to Hong Kong to serve in some of the front companies and to work at places like China Resources because they had those skills. Um, there's a, I should say too, there's a murky quality to some of these early commercial operations where they were tied to intelligence and security considerations as well. And so it's, it's difficult to get a full sense of, of the activities, we'll say, um, but there are signs. So for example, there was a, the, the colonial authorities raided one of the front companies at one point, um, and confiscated a ton of material, and it was a little bit of a flap. And subsequent Chinese internal uh, instructions from the party said, you know, this we have to clamp down on this. You're supposed to burn documents after reading them. Do not care. Do not maintain certain kinds of documents in the storefronts and this and that to make sure that that kind of thing didn't happen too. So a lot of these folks were, were engaged in business activities, but may also have been participating in in other activities um, as well. Well, that's uh, about. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that that's true for uh, many of the entities in Hong Kong at that time, whether it's on the CCP side or on the other side. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely the case. Yep. <laughs> uh, we have a follow up question. I think this one zooms out a little bit to uh, to uh, explore an understanding of the situation a little bit more conceptually. Uh, Winnie Lai has a follow up question. Could we so could we say the drivers for these trades? are mostly for realist reasons, that is survival and strength of China. And as such ideological differences are of secondary importance despite the trade's smallest scale. Well, that's another great question. I don't know that I would go that far. I mean, that's an open question. I think I certainly realist considerations in the sense of, of, of financial considerations, hard, pol hard political calculations, security considerations are very important. But what's interesting is that those, those considerations are not unalloyed in the, the records, the historical records. So ideology does play a really important role in terms of filtering how these realist calculations are, how, how they're perceived, how developments are perceived. And they sort of tug in different ways um, and shape policy as they do so. So for example, um, the Great Leap Forward is a perfect example of where at the Ministry of Foreign Trade, there's so much emphasis on having a, a united front when facing abroad and not negotiating with multiple um, partners at the same time of having sort of united fronts in these commercial engagements when, when facing abroad, particularly when facing capitalist trade partners, right? Because of all of the inherent threats that come along with that. Uh, but the push for decentralization during the Great Leap Forward, which is an, I think it's fair to say is an ideological, an ideologically driven change, um, undid that completely. And it had very real economic consequences and had very negative consequences for many trade deals um, that reverberated throughout the party. Um, and that was done entirely because of ideological considerations, right? So, and, and the party knew, party leadership knew ahead of time that, um, that that would most likely be the case. Like Joe and Lai, for example, was probably, you know, lost 10 years of his life trying to put this thing back together uh, in the early 1960s because of the fallout from these decisions, these ideological decisions. So I wouldn't dismiss it entirely. I think it's an important part of the story, I guess, is what I would say. Great. We have another group of questions. I think this, uh, these questions speak to the contemporary ramifications of, um, of the story you're telling. Um, so one asks, how do you feel your research can inform our understanding of current trade wars between China and the US? And another asks you how you feel, um, do, whether you feel that our leaders today, I guess our PRC leadership, realizes that these foreign influences had a disproportionate effect on China's trajectory. Good questions. Yeah. And one of the reasons why that's such a great question too is because it reminds me that I should say that these are just my views. These are not the views of, of the Naval War College or, or anyone else here in the, in the U.S. government. So thank you for that question, especially for that reason, because I, I neglected to mention that earlier. Um, in terms of how does it help us to understand the trade wars? For me, I think it's, it's if we don't understand this history, then we don't understand that the language 
of, of a liberal international order and free trade and the post-war international order that is very common in, in US policymaking and, 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 and other places as well, that, that is seen differently um, through the eyes of the leadership in Beijing, potentially because of this historical experience, right? The post-war international commercial scene for decades for the leadership in Beijing was not open and inclusive. It was the opposite of that, right? It was exclusive by design for, for reasons that are a separate issue, but that is a, that is a historical fact, right? So that experience leaves a mark on institutions and on the party for sure. And so the, the, when we fast forward to contemporary policy debates, I think it's important for, for different actors to understand that each of them is bringing a different historical perspective to the table when having these kinds of conversations. And so what might look like uh, a new policy, let's say a trade war policy or a tariff policy, um, might be geared for a particular policy outcome in a certain context, might not be seen that way by different parties who have a different recollection uh, of, of what that kind of tool has meant in the past. Um, I apologize if that sounds a little bit convoluted, if that, but the point is that each of these, these historical experiences color, color the way that leadership thinks about trade wars and the implications of these trade wars. And so I think uh, it would do many policymakers a, a service if they were more familiar with the baggage that comes along uh, with some of these tools uh, because they have been used in the past and they meant different things at different times. Um, well, the, the story you're telling obviously is important uh, from various standpoints and uh, from the perspective of Hong Kong, where, where I'm based. Um, I wonder how, well, yeah, knowing that you have done a lot of archival work in Hong Kong, uh, many of your sources um, you know, are located in Hong Kong. I wonder how you would think through the, um, the response of Hong Kong actors in that period. As you said, um, one of the um, most fascinating part of the story is that it was not a straightforward um, teleological development um, to the reform and opening era, uh, but there were a lot of twists and turns. Um, how did the various entities in Hong Kong respond to that during that time? And how do these various factors, many of, many of which would still be, uh, could still be found in Hong Kong, um, have been incorporated in the power dynamics as we see it today, see them today in Hong Kong. Do you mean so Hong Kong entities? You mean Hong Kong Hong Kongers basically participating uh, in trade? Yes, yes. And how, okay, so how have they responded to the twists and turns? Um, oh, that's a really good question. I, I think, I mean, Hong Kong was really consistently essential. For it's one of the one of the um, one of the constants in the book is how essential Hong Kong was um, as a source as a conduit for so much of China's foreign trade. In fact, most of China's foreign exchange earnings came through Hong Kong. Most of it was trade with Southeast Asia, right? And so Hong Kong quietly provided that essential service. Uh, consistently throughout the twists and turns, um, despite the fact that there were significant political uh, complications, particularly in the, in the late 1960s, um, but continued to serve that, that vital purpose. And I think, um, you know, senior Chinese Communist Party leadership understood that and was very careful not to disrupt that because it was such an essential lifeline for, for foreign exchange and for other, um, other imports and as an export conduit as well. And so uh, I honestly would say that, that my understanding of the role that Hong Kongers played was, was relatively consistent in that regard and playing a role as a, as a, as a conduit for um, so much of Chinese trade. Great. Well, I, I know we are... Um reaching the end of the hour, but if we can just squeeze in this last question, which is from Sean James uh, at the University of British Columbia. The question is, at what point did the PRC regime establish a state monopoly on foreign trade, preventing individual capitalists from engaging in foreign trade? 
Was it immediately upon taking power or was it not until the capitalists ceased to be capitalist after the state bought out or expropriated private and joint industry? So it was a, it was a slow strangulation is the short answer. So it was not immediate. Um, and certain entities were allowed to exist for longer. Typically, it was financially beneficial to sort of hive them off and increase through mandates, local mandates, the cost of labor and wages, and for example, to sort of siphon away any foreign exchange earnings or, or savings that these some of these institutions had, and then have them sort of wither away uh, and leave. But some of these organizations stayed for, for years longer than you might think, like Shell, for example, was there until well into, I think, the... Um, late 1950s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, HSBC had a branch until the mid 1950s as well. So they 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 would cling cling to life, um, and they continued to exist as long as um, the host institutions thought there was a prospect of some sort of revitalization, uh, and as long as it was useful to have them there uh, for for party coffers and for propaganda purposes as well to show that there are different kinds of actors still operating in China. Great. Well, thanks very much. I, I know uh, we've taken up a lot of your time, but uh, judging from the, the response of a large crowd and the, um, and the way uh, the, the questions touch on different subjects, uh, I can surely say that we should all get a copy of a book and read it carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and we cannot wait to uh, welcome you back to Hong Kong so that you can uh, tell us more about this project and your next one as well. Um, but before I sign, before we sign off, let me just say that this is a, the uh, concluding session of the Chinese Business History Seminar for this term and this year. Um, so, and because of that, we are all the more honored to have Jason uh, to be our uh, concluding speaker as well. Uh, but we are coming to get, putting together a, a strong list of um, talks in the coming year. So stay tuned. We'll be uh, posting that online and sending out email to all of you in due course. Uh, in the meantime, have a great summer and we will uh, see you back in September. And thank you very much again, J again, Jason. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Great questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>